Be seated, please. Jurors, we're now going to hear from Mr. McKeon, and I think I should alert you ahead of time because we look at the clock and we see it's about quarter after 11. Mr. McKeon is going to argue till 12 or 12.15 or so, and then he's uh, going to take a break, and what we're going to do is we'll break for lunch at that time, so we'll have lunch at a fairly normal time. Uh, and then after lunch, Mr. McKeon will finish his argument. Mr. McKeon. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. It's been three weeks, and it's been like a long time, I know, for you, and it's been for us as well. I felt particularly bad last Saturday. Dr. Fosdell was on all day. It was the sixth day of the week, and I know it was difficult for you as, as it was difficult for Mr. Boyle and I and, and the judge and so forth. Yet I was intent on your seeing how thorough Dr. Fosdell was. And if I pushed your patience, I'm sorry that I did. But I think when you sit down to decide this case, you will appreciate that we put on that we were as thorough as we were. But I do apologize particularly for that day because I was weary, you were weary, but you kept at it, you kept with it, and I deeply appreciate that. I am advocate for the people of the state of Wisconsin. I've been that way, that, in that role for a long time. I'm very proud and very happy to be doing it. I'm officer, an officer of this court, and I've been very pleased with this trial, with your, particularly with your continuing attention. I'd, I'd like to go back to when we first met each other, and that's what we call the voir dire examination. A little bit was out here in court, but a great deal of it was in chambers, and I asked each of you a number of questions, and I'm going to remind you of some of those questions. First, we started out by saying the burden of proof in this case is on the defendant. That's unusual in the system of justice. But what we say in the state of Wisconsin is, Jeffrey Dahmer has killed 15 people. He sits here a killer in this courtroom, convicted of being a killer. He now asks you not to hold him responsible for those killings. This is a responsibility hearing. He is saying, don't hold me criminally responsible for those killings. And the state very properly says, you're going to have to prove that then, Mr. Dahmer. And you said you'd go with that, that you wouldn't even psychologically put that burden. And I know there's an instinctive, well, the DA didn't prove this or that. Please, if anybody says in, cha in your jury chambers, well, the DA didn't prove this, stop them. Say, no, 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 no. The district attorney doesn't have to prove anything. And that's a switch of gears that it may be hard to do because psychologically, we've all been watching films and so on, we expect the district attorney to prove something. I think we did prove it. We brought on a case as though it were our obligation. We presented the best psychiatrists, the most capable people, evidence from lay witnesses, from doctors, from the facts of the case. We proved sanity, but we didn't have to prove anything. The burden is entirely on the defendant, who seeks to escape responsibility for the slayings with which he has already been found to have committed, to which he pled guilty. Please, during your deliberations, you said you would abide by that in the voir dire examination when you were first questioned. You said you would abide by that, please. I didn't have to put anything on. After, after Dr. Palermo and Dr. Friedman, the court experts top, stopped testifying, I could have rested the case and you'd have to wrestle with it, with that evidence. I could have done that, but I didn't. I pressed forward. Please keep in mind, the burden is on the defendant to a reasonable certainty, reasonable certainty by the greater weight of the credible evidence. If you are not so satisfied of that, you are to answer the court's question, no. Are you satisfied to a reasonable certainty by the greater weight? I don't have to prove anything. If you get back in that jury room and you say, you know, I don't know, I can't tell, which is it? I don't know. Then you're not satisfied to a reasonable certainty and you have to answer you're not satisfied to a reasonable certainty. I know I hear that argument the reverse as a district attorney. Defense attorney will get up in the typical case when the burden is ours and they'll argue that he didn't prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. And sometimes they'll say, look it, I don't have to prove he's innocent. The defense attorney will say this in a typical trial. I don't have to prove he's innocent. Not guilty doesn't mean innocent. Not guilty means the DA didn't prove it. That's what in a typical case. In this case, not satisfied to a reasonable certainty simply says that doesn't say that you're finding him sane. It just simply says the defense didn't prove 
that the defendant, by a reasonable certainty, did not prove that the defendant was not responsible. It's an important concept. So that finding doesn't say he's sane. It says he hasn't proven that he's insane to a reasonable certainty. So don't say we have to find him sane. You don't. You assess what the defense's proof is. And if you're not satisfied to a reasonable certainty that he's insane, then the answer is no. You're not going in there to say we got to agree that he's sane. That's not it. The issue is did he satisfy you to a reasonable certainty that he was insane? If he didn't, then the answer is no. At the same time, I think we proved it, that we proved sanity anyways, and I'll talk about that further as I go along. But that is a profoundly important distinction. And I, I, you, you, took, you said you'd abide by it, and I ask you to continue to abide by it. It isn't is he sane or insane, it's did he prove to a reasonable certainty that he was insane. If he didn't, the answer is no. You don't have to make a finding that he was sane. You're not being asked to make a finding that he was sane. You're being asked to make a finding, did he prove to a reasonable certainty that he was insane? That's the issue before you. Okay. We had talked about a number of things. Number one, with the mere fact that a person is, is, uh, does a, an unnatural act mean that he have a mental disease? You agreed that you wouldn't find that way. Does the mere, is the court's going to instruct you on this? This isn't words that I put together. Does the mere fact that the enormity of what he's done, does the enormity of what he's done mean that, uh, that, that by that alone he must be insane? Because we talked about it in the blood here. Some people, as Dr. Palermo said, by the way, candidly, I thought he must be crazy from what he did. The enormity of this, or the unnaturalness of this, as the court will instruct you, is not grounds for saying he's mentally diseased. And the court will instruct you on that. Because otherwise, well, then he must be, if he got away with 10 more, hey, but if he got stopped after one, then uh, what? It isn't that, it isn't how successful you are, how many you can get away with, that somehow if he got 35 or 40, then he must be even uh, more out of it. Not at all, it's not the enormity of the acts or the unnaturalness of the acts. And that's also, we discussed it right here. We talked about alcohol. And I asked you if you'd abide by the instructions of the court. And there are specific instructions about the role of alcohol in, an insan in the insanity instruction that the judge will give you. I asked you, you said you would abide by that, and I ask you to listen carefully when the judge gives it. I also talked that under certain circumstances, and the judge will advise you as to what weight should be given if lay witnesses testify. If lay witnesses testify. And we had put on lay witnesses that talked about his mental status. Curious question. He has lived here 10 years in this community, this defendant, and not one lay witness came into court to say, yeah, he's goofy, or he's crazy, or this. Not one lay witness. But we bought in, brought in people that did, that had had contact with him. Why didn't Jeffrey Dahmer's defense put on someone to say, I've known him. He lived at the grandma's house from December of 81 or January of 82, till he got his first apartment in 85 or so, 86. Why didn't someone come forward, a lay witness? Why didn't someone from elsewhere that had contact with him and say, yeah, I'd known that guy. He's goofy, he's crazy, he does odd stuff. We put him on that said the opposite. That's what lay witness testimony is. And you've gotta sit back and say, gee, he's lived here 10 years and not one human being came into this courtroom and said, yeah, they had to go out of this state to get someone to come in here and say that he wasn't sane. That's what they had to do. Keep that in mind. That's the importance of lay witnesses. First, the lay witnesses that we put on to say he didn't seem any strange to us. I'll recite all of the questions we asked. He didn't seem strange to us, but consider the negative. He put on no one to come in and say, yeah, he's odd, he's different, he's strange. I noticed this, I noticed that. He talked incoherent, he babbled here. Not one witness, and he's lived here 10 years. I asked you three things about the expert witnesses in the voir dire. I said, would you consider their experience, their competence, and their thoroughness? <laughs> Experience, competence, and thoroughness. I'll talk in a few minutes about that, but that's what I asked on the voir dire. And you indicated, all of you indicated, that you would do that. Experience, competence, and thoroughness, which seemed to me 
reasonable grounds, reasonable way to evaluate the competence of the expert test of the expert witnesses. Let's talk about a few things that were raised by Mr. Boyle in his opening statement in terms of this defendant did not come, uh, he came, did not come from a, a background of ferocious hardship. Various people are beaten and sexually abused by their parents, assaulted by their father, occasionally by a mother, by a brother. They're beaten and kicked and knocked around. You know people like that and I know people like that, that have had a life that was a living hell as a youngster, that lived in fear of a drunken father to come in and kick and beat the child. To be, uh, to be awakened and, and to find out as, as that, you're, that someone is touching you sexually and the terrible confusion that a child has of, of a parent sexually molesting that child. All of the experts agreed. Mr. Dahmer had no sexual abuse as a child, no physical abuse as a child. There was, uh, there was a problem, it was a broken home. There are probably people in this jury box that came from a broken home. There are people in this courtroom that came from a broken home. There's word now to some extent that 40 to 50% of the marriages are broken homes. Yeah, that's not easy on a kid. I'm not saying it's easy. Discussion about friends. Dr. Becker talked about friends. He had one particularly good friend at age five uh, that he had. The parents gave him a dog. His parents had named Trisky. Again from Dr. Becker, at age seven, the family moved to Barberton, Ohio. They lived there until Mr. Dahmer was eight. Age eight, Mr. Dahmer recalls making some good neighborhood friends called, and this went on in later years, he recalled being friends with a boy next door over a number of years. They eventually had a homosexual experience, touched each other. Uh, that was a friend over several years. It was not a violent sexual experience. It was a consensual sexual experience. Testimony about a lad named David in fourth grade where he and uh, defendant David were good friends for three years. I disagreed. The, one of the mothers, the mother of David stepped in and said, no, I don't like this friendship. I feel that sad that that had happened. I moved as a kid a number of times. My dad was in a business that had us move. I hated to leave my friends and say goodbye to my friends, but that happens to people. Talked on about uh, another friend, uh, this friendship with Eric went on a number of years. At age 15, Mr. Dahmer was in the 10th grade. He recalled being fr good friends. He recalled being friends with a boy named Greg. That later on, uh, he had a friend named Jeff Six. I don't know what Jeff Six, at one point there's testimony, Jeff Six hit some dogs with a car and how the, the defendant didn't care for that, but that was a friend of his. This isn't a man that's lived, uh, been abused and kicked and knocked around and you say, oh, we see what happened. He lived in a, on a plot of land in Bath, Ohio, one and a quarter acres, nice home, a pond in front of the house. This is not someone that just say, my God, he would, how could he survive the way he was abused and so on. That didn't happen in this case. You don't have someone standing here, as happens in a lot of criminal cases, saying I was kicked and beaten and assaulted and raped, denied, neglected. That's not what we have here. The defendant picked up some thoughts. How and our doctor opined on it, how it may have happened, uh, the, the, the interest in, in uh, at least in, t in a totally compliant sex partner, which was his first choice, a live, totally compliant sex partner, and an interest somewhere along the way in, in that that would carry over because of the compliance over to, the, to sex with a, a dead person. What is this urge that we're talking about and this again is from the Sexual Disorders, the DSM-3R manual. Over a period of at least six months, recurrent intense sexual urges and sexually arousing fantasies that the person either acts on or simply is distressed by. Sexual urges, sexual urges, not an urge to kill, not an urge to kill. Every doctor that testified there was a unanimity on that agreement. He did not have an urge to kill. He did not enjoy killing. He found killing unpleasant. He found it aversive, they say in their technical words. You may recall the most vivid description is that when Mr. Dahmer had drugged Ernest Miller and didn't have sufficient drugs and he was feared that Ernest Miller was becoming conscious again and Dr. Dr. Becker said he went and got some more alcohol and consumed it and then took a knife and stabbed Ernest Miller in the carotid artery. Sexual urges is what we're talking about. Sexual urges, first for a compliant body, a living male, 
and then sexual urges towards a dead body. We've all got sexual urges. Dr. Uh, Dr. Dietz testified that he was in, within the normal range, talked about masturbating, as I recall, two or three times a day. He said that's in the higher end of the normal range, of the normal range. Dr. Becker talked about uh, masturbating when he started as a young man. Uh, so in the normal range, sexual urge, somehow there's a, and this is where the word compulsion is so tricky. Instinctively, we think sex with a dead body, repulsive. Why would someone do that? It must be some compelling force, some compunction inside, pushing him into this. He doesn't want to do it. That's the suggestion of the word compulsion. But you have to understand what this disorder is. He didn't experience it as a compulsion any more than you experience your sexual desires as a compulsion. It was a sexual desire. At one point, Mr. when Dr. Berlin was rolling along, Mr. Boyle asked him a question. He said, however, Mr. Boyle closed the question. I couldn't, couldn't, don't remember that, but I remember Dr. Berlin's answer. He said, no, Mr. Boyle, it's sexually exciting for him. So when that's why the word compulsion is so tricky. Naturally, you think dead body, ah, and the word compulsion seems to, what would be pushing you into sex with a dead body? But if, if you have a sexual desire for it, and that's what, his, that's what the emotion was. That's what the definition, I read the definition of paraphilia from the dsm 3 act. It's the sexual desire for that. Just like some people like, a, 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 hopefully, a kind of fat man in his mid-50s and losing a little hair. How people are drawn in this room here, there are different people drawn to different sexual things. Some of you may perhaps enjoy bizarre things sexually. And there, there's, there's nothing, nothing bizarre between consenting. You've read it and I've read it in pop psychology. They say there's nothing bizarre between consenting sexual partners. If you want to dress up like, uh, like uh, uh, the Queen Anne and your husband comes in as the king or vice versa, there's nothing bizarre about that. It's consensual. And people do have bizarre tastes. And some people, as Dr. Dietz said, some people have necrophilic tastes. And how do they, he talked about how you relieve it. In the same way this defendant relieved it, except at age 18, at age 18, he decided he had these sexual desires. Maybe somebody in this jury box had a sexual desire at age 18. I had sexual desires at age 18. Let me tell you, I had keen sexual desires. Sexual desires, strong. I had to control them. You had to control yours. What this defendant did, he didn't enjoy the killing. He didn't enjoy the killing. But as Fosdell said it, as Dietz said it, Palermo the others, Palermo described it as lust. Lust. Good old fashioned, solid word that expresses what's involved here. A desire, a god awful, terrible thing that we don't even want to consider what this defendant did. What this defendant did with this man, and this is the one time I'm going to cite Dr. Wallstrom, because he said the defendant said he had a choice on this one. This is the hitchhiker in Bath, Ohio. He had a choice, according to Wallstrom. He decided, this man that sits in this courtroom now, who has been described as average intelligence or superior intelligence, keep that in mind when you assess him. This man, it seems almost incredible, that a man, to, for sexual purposes, for his sexual <coughs> satisfaction, his sexual satisfaction killed Stephen Hicks. I don't know Stephen Hicks, I never did. But he didn't have the right for sexual pleasure to kill this man. So he had the desire. I had desires, you had desires. Did you fulfill all the desires you had at age 18? I'm 55 and I've still got a few that I haven't satisfied. This guy decided that he is going to make Stephen Hicks die so that he can extend his sexual desire, his pleasures. It's hard, hard. So it's inhuman to think of what he did. Underlying, never wanting to kill. Never got that urge to kill. No sexually connected desire. He's not a sadist doesn't get sexual pleasure out of killing. Everybody agrees on that. It's not the sexual desire does not embrace the killing. He doesn't like the killing, but he decides to extend my sexual pleasure 
for a couple of days, a couple of days, I am going to kill. And down the line, he killed after that. Maybe not Stephen Twomey. He hasn't been charged with Stephen Twomey. Because we don't know precisely what happened. But after that, that's the story. And don't think, oh my God, compulsion, because it's so ugly, the thought of a dead body. To him, it was exciting. How would you like a compliant, talk about the selfishness, a totally compliant sexual partner. Talk about the underlying selfishness here. The partner does everything that you want, and you do nothing the partner wants. The partner lies there completely subject. You don't want to have someone have anal intercourse with you, but you drug them, and you have an anal intercourse with him. We're talking about a, a tremendously selfish, and I'll give a quote here about his warped selfishness that he gave to, particularly to the, to the police about his own selfish desire. And that's what we're talking about. Not an abused, beaten, sexually assaulted kid that had no normal exposure to what sex should be. Not that at all. He did have the idea, no one is saying he didn't, that he didn't have this sexual desire. A sexual desire for a totally compliant person. But that's what we're talking about here. And keep, please keep it in mind. A decision to act to satisfy sexual urges. What is the defendant's choice at the time he's arrested? He's got 11 skulls. Four of them are in flesh still. He's chopped the heads off. He hasn't finished processing. Got rid of the flesh. He's defleshed them and put them in the garbage or acidified them and flushed them down the toilet. He hasn't gotten around to boiling the skulls, to clearing them out, to keep his mementos. What choices did Jeffrey Dahmer have when he was arrested that day? Oh, he was cooperative, he was cooperative. What kind of choices do you think he had? Do you think it would be any different? Maybe we couldn't have found out who all those people were, but we'd have found out who a number were. Modern odontology, you know that, the teeth. You can find out who these people are. And the fully in flesh skulls, it's their picture. And you publish the picture. And you say, who is this? So what choices did Jeffrey Dahmer have but to cooperate? But to cooperate. Don't get fooled by, oh, he wanted to do this, sure. He wanted once he, when his situation was what he was in, he was gonna try to minimize the, the damage to himself to do what he could. Another very tragic aspect of this is sexual urges, not try. I'm gonna go through the litany, the, the, through the, the timeline before I stop, probably sometime after lunch that I'll go through the timeline. But after Tuomi, after Stephen Tuomi, there's a discussion, and this is verified with Fosdell, Dietz, I think the others as well. The police definitely told the police, after the death of Stephen Tuomi, besides he's not gonna try to resist those urges anymore. I've had a few diets, I've been on a few diets where I didn't resist the urge to eat chocolate-covered donuts. But we're not talking about an urge to eat chocolate-covered donuts. We're talking about a, an urge for corpses and a decision you're going to kill people to get those corpses. Mr. Boyle is pounded on the alcoholic. You could maybe possibly, arguably, draw well, similarities in a way. An alcoholic wants a drink. A person wants a dead body. If he's in a morgue, there's a dead body there. Mm, there's a drive for that, a pull for that. But the alcoholic doesn't say, don't convict me if I go out and kill someone for a drink. You recognize, you don't say to an alcoholic, yeah, you got a problem, you gotta kill somebody for a drink, that's okay, we understand. This man with a dead body is gonna have an, a, 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 an attraction to it. But you don't say, hey, if there's no dead body, okay, go out and kill someone. And if you don't wanna do it, you're aversive to it, have a couple of drinks and kill him, but Jeff, Jeffrey, you want a dead body, go ahead. That's what we're talking about. And the, 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 the killing is apart from that. As Dietz said, it's not part of the paraphilia, and as every doctor said, he didn't enjoy the killing. We're not here with a sexual sadist paraphilia. If he was a sexual sadist paraphilia, I suppose the Dr. Berlin would be in here saying he's a sexual sadist paraphilia. I want to make one point clear on Dr. Dietz as well. In the opening statement, it's an important word that, that, that what Dr. Dietz disagreed with his colleagues on, be, please be very careful here, he wanted to expand the definition of paraphilia. Dr. Dietz did to include people who, who, who didn't act on the paraphilia, who weren't distressed by the paraphilia, but still he said 
persons that think about it all the time, even if they're not distressed by it, even if they don't act on it, he said the, 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 the category should be expanded to include that group. And some of his colleagues disagreed with that and said, no, we will limit it to people that act on the paraphilia or persons who are distressed by it for over six months. That's what Dr. Dietz differed on. What about... What about the real difference that he pointed? What Dr. Dietz really pointed out was, was that Dr. Berlin, the great difference between the, psych, the forensic psychiatric community looking at paraphilias and saying, look it, that's not a defense to a murder case. That's not a defense to a murder case, a paraphilia. He said, no, that's, that isn't done, except the only forensic psychiatrist that he knew of that subscribed to that idea was Dr. Fred Berlin. Who do we see here testifying? Dr. Fred Berlin comes in to testify. I think you've got to, you've got to think. And I talked about experience, thoroughness, competence. This is a 15 count murder case. You've got three experts, never, none of them testified in a murder case before. Dr. Fred Berlin has testified in responsibility seven to nine times, seven to nine times on responsibility and has never testified on responsibility in a murder case. Never testified on responsibility in a murder case. And he is the only identified forensic psychiatrist by Dr. Dietz who subscribes to the idea that a paraphilia is a defense on a responsibility issue. He is the only one, Dr. Dr. Dietz said, that he knows of that would say what this man has is a defense to a murder case. Hence, he's appearing here for his first experience is testifying on non-responsibility in a murder case. Dr. Becker, a nice lady. Dr. Berlin as well, in terms of treatment, yes. Dr. Becker has never testified on responsibility. She told you, not just in a murder case, she has never testified on anything from disorderly conduct upward. Never testified on a murder responsibility case. Dr. Wallstrom, never testified on a murder, in a murder case. Dr. Wallstrom completed his training, his fellowship, although he'd been a doctor several years, he completed his fellowship in July of 1992. He is less, today when he testified, he was less than seven or eight months out of his training period. Less than seven or eight months out of his training period. He had never testified in a murder case or a robbery case or a burglary case. He has testified once before. He's testified on, a, on an exposure, in an, an indecent exposure case. So between all three of the defense experts, you've got Berlin seven to nine times. You've got Wallstrom once. So that would make that 10. And you've got Becker never. So 10 altogether among the three of them, they've testified 10 times on responsibility and never testified in a murder case. You gotta shake your head on that one and say, hey, what's going on here? What's going on here? You've got a defense, you've got Dr. Berlin heading the team, raising a defense that Dr. Deist said the forensic psychiatry community simply does not support. That's what the defense is here. And you have to ask why these totally, almost totally, well on murder, among, among three of them, 10 appearances as for, uh, on responsibility among the three of them, we brought to this courtroom hundreds of experiences through Dr. Dietz and Dr. Fosdell. The court appointed Dr. Palermo with hundreds of times. You think the court would appoint someone six months, eight months out of training? What would you say about that? Eight months out of training. You've got to seriously weigh that and say, what's going on in this courtroom with a serial killer, 15 murders charged, at least 17 that he's involved in, and we wind up with three experts who have never testified in a murder case and altogether have only testified 10 times on the issue of mental responsibility. What's going on here? I'd like to talk about planning. Here's what the defendant said to the police. This is the, the 
as follows. At this time I began, you've heard this read, I'm going to reread it, reread it to you because I think it's that important. At this time I began to question Dahmer regarding the way in which he would decide which individuals to approach. This is related to individuals that eventually became victims of his. Listen to this. He stated that before going out for the evening, he generally would know whether or not he planned to commit a homicide. And before going out, he would prepare the drug by powderizing it and leaving it in a glass on the countertop of his kitchen. He states once at the bar, he would generally drink by himself and observe the different individuals in the gay establishment. He states that it did not matter the color, race, or ethnic heritage of any of his victims as long as they met what he would call the phys physical profile. He stated that this was generally from mid to late teens to mid twenties, males with a medium height, slender build, and generally smooth skin. He stated upon sitting in the taverns and drinking, he would notice one, maybe two or three, who fit this profile, whom he found attractive. He also stated that he would generally look for the individuals that were alone or not with a tight-knit group. He states upon deciding which victim he found attractive, he would generally wait until approximately bar time, which would be closing at the tavern. And then as the patrons were, were filing up, he would approach the victim and ask if they wished to accompany him home for either pictures, sexual contact, or for cocktails many of the times offering the money. He states this was his general routine, except for times when he met some of his victims on the street, in front of the bookstores, and then the same routine as far as offering money for sex, photographs, or cocktails. Plans it before he goes out. Cold-blooded planning for sexual satisfaction. Your life your life, your life for my sexual satisfaction. Your body will rot in a couple of days. So my sexual satisfaction for a couple of days is going to cost you your life. Another statement to the police. He stated the reason why he would have the taxi drop him off several blocks from his apartment was in order to keep the taxi driver from knowing exactly where he lived at and to see if anyone had been following him as he did not want anyone to detect his activities. And the defense for that planning, that, that cold-blooded planning, the defense is this paraphilia defense. This paraphilia defense. I'm not saying it's not a real problem, but it's a new, a new argument, a new argument that Dr. Berlin came in for the first time in his experience to testify to. I've talked a little bit about the doctors. No one is saying that anyone's a charlatan. No one that, that, not saying that. I've asked you to, in the voir dire, to talk about experience. Uh, Dr. Berlin is an experienced in treatment. Dr. Becker is experienced in treatment. And I've talked already about the total lack of experience in terms of forensic assessment. Dr. Berlin is apparently a, a forensic psychiatrist, apparently unto himself, that feels this paraphilia should mean that a person should not be held responsible for it. And Dr. Becker, I, I do not know. Uh, she, she is totally without experience at all testifying. So until she testified to that, one would assume it would not be known what her attitude was because she had not testified before on it. Dr. Wallstrom, a fine young man, he's not young, he worked a little while before he went on through medical school, but he's a fine young man and uh, he hung tough. He talked about that he was psychotic. He was the only doctor. The court doctors said, no, he's not psychotic. Dr. Berlin and Dr. Becker said he's not psychotic. The doctor, uh, our doctors, Dr. Fosdell and Dr. Dietz said he's not psychotic, but Dr. Wallstrom, the man just out of training said, no, he is psychotic. Uh, and I pointed out, I said, well, doctor, and I, I referred to a Dr. Charles Lodel that had examined the defendant on January 5, 1989. I said, doctor, look at this Dr. Lodel uh, examined him, and he said he's not psychotic. And Dr. Walsham said, well, when did he do it? I said, January of 1989, the murders were underway. 
Dr. Walston didn't respond after that. I pointed out that when he was at, at DePaul uh, and trying to address the, where he was being required to address the drinking problem, that Dr. Greg Krems had examined him. And Dr. Krems, I pointed out, Dr. Krems said he's got no psychotic processes, thought processes. Dr. Wallstrom hung tough. You, you have to credit him for hanging tough. All the doctors looked at it, at that issue. I'll touch on various reasons why they did, but all the doctors looked at it, and all the experienced doctors said he is not psychotic. All of them said that, except Dr. Wallstrom, eight months out of his training period. I'm not saying that's not a personal attack on Dr. Wallstrom. He may be a very fine man, but it, it's raising a question. Would you expect that Mr that the defendant's attorney here would be eight months out of law school in, in a case with 15 counts of, of murder? And yet the psychiatrist was eight months out of his training program. How much time did the doctor spend? Dr. Berlin said he spent four hours and 45 minutes, four hours and 45 minutes with the defendant. If, depending on how you handle this, you are going to rue his attitude in one particular way. I started talking about the separate cases after the first several. Well, he said, I, I don't have to count the trees to know I'm in a forest. Well, you're gonna have to count the trees. You're coming back on separate counts. That's why each of my doctors went count by count. That's why I kept you in the box that Saturday afternoon when you perhaps were ready to to say to me, Mr. McCann, pull the shade and leave. Because I wanted you to know that Dr. Fosdell went through it count by count because a skilled forensic psychiatrist knows that one day you would be going through it count by count. And I don't know what you're gonna do with Dr. Berlin's statement, I don't have to count all the trees to know I'm in a forest because you've gotta count all those trees. That's why I had Dr. Dietz go through it count by count pointing out why it was, why he appreciated the wrongfulness here and why he could conform his conduct to the requirements of the law because I knew you'd have to go through it count by count. I don't know what you're gonna do with Dr. Berlin. Several things I asked him which I thought were reasonable questions. I said, did he intend to plan, did he plan to kill SS? This is the sexual assault case, SS. Yes, he did. Did you ask him that, doctor? No, I didn't. I knew he intended to do it. Dr. Becker said that he told Dr. Becker that he didn't kill SS because he's gonna go to work that night. That's what he told Fosdell, that's what he told Dietz. That's an important control question. Sexual urge, sexual urge that says, uh, look at I gotta go to work tonight. If you'll forgive a story that uh, the man that said, honey, I love you, I'll fight lions. I'll climb mountains, and if it doesn't rain tonight, I'll come over and see you. How strong is that sexual urge? And Dietz asked that. He talked about it being within the normal range. How strong is that sexual urge? Berlin said he was gonna kill him. He was gonna kill him. I think there was pretty much agreement that he was gonna kill Flowers, but was there agreement that he was gonna kill? Becker said, he said he's, that's what he told our doctors too. How did Berlin find that? Another point Berlin said, well, he, this ritual cutting up of the body. I said, doctor, did you ask him, did you ask him if he was involved in a ritual? He said, no, I didn't ask him. I knew it had to be that way. Well, our doctors asked him at length. And he talked about it being an onerous, troublesome job. He didn't like it, cutting it up. He didn't like doing it when he was at grandmother's house. He wore old clothes and did it. We asked him, how'd you do it at grandmother's house? How'd you do it at your place? They got down to his place. He didn't like to get his clothes spattered. He'd be naked, but he didn't like the job. He didn't like it. He liked an open, this. he liked to masturbate into an open thing, but he never liked cutting up the bodies. How can Dr. Berlin say there was a ritual when, when he denied there was and said he didn't, he didn't like the job? You gotta question that, but when you only see a person for four hours and 45 minutes, you don't have the time to ask those questions. I figure there were 20 important incidences here, 20, plus the family background. Let's say that Dr. Berlin took the family background for 45 minutes, and all of them felt it was important. That left him four hours, 
Four times 60 is 240 minutes. You got the 15 slayings, and each one should be explored, as our psychiatrist did. You got the 15 slayings. You got the, the decision not to kill SS. You've got the flowers incident, and you got the LP incident. Those are three important incidences to explore. And then you've got Stephen Hicks and Steve Tuomi. 17 bodies, 17 bodies, two of them not charged, all of them have to be explored, plus the three that he didn't kill, Flowers, SS, and LP. 20 important things to explore, in my opinion, as well as the family background, and other issues, of course. If you spend, if you're Dr. Berlin and you spend 45 minutes on the family, you got 20 incidences and 240 minutes to cover the territory. That's about 10 or 12 minutes apiece. You can't do it. Yes, you could, counsel can work up things, could make it easier, but you don't rely on counsel. Maybe it's helpful. You ask the questions yourself. That's what our doctors did. Dr. Fosdell spent 17 hours, I think he said. Dr. Dietz spent 18 hours. You got a tough job in front of you. 15 murders. This is not a single count charge where you can go over the facts in, 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 in a couple of hours. This is 15, 17 homicides spread over a number of years and three that, there were, that didn't result in a homicide. You can't say I see the forest, I don't count the trees. Because it's important to know, did he want to kill SS or not, and to ask him that. Did it, was there a ritual involved? Did he somehow enjoy chopping up the bodies? Did he enjoy that? Was there a ritual chanting while he chopped up the bodies? Told everybody there wasn't. He told no doctor that there was. When our doctors asked him, he said, no, there wasn't. He didn't like the job. But Dr. Berlin says, no, there was a ritual, but he didn't ask. And I think you, you, for four, you gotta say four hours and 45 minutes, doctor, maybe it just isn't enough. And he met for an hour and 10 minutes the day before he, he began to testify. There's a question left there that, that is raised in my mind. Dr. Berlin testified that he told her something that that night that he masturbated into the viscera. That's what he told Dr. Berlin the night before the psychiatric testimony testified. We questioned who was there with you, Dr. Berlin, and one of the lawyers was there with Dr. Berlin, with Dr. Becker. But Dr. Berlin didn't testify about that. I asked Berlin, well, what are you, four of the cases, I said, well, look, at, there was no sex in four of the cases, apparently, uh, that after, the, after they died. He said, no, I'm sure there was. Well, did you ask? I know there was. I didn't have to ask. I know there was. But he said nothing about being told that, and I pushed him on that issue. He never said, well, Dahmer told me that. And yet he was up there Sunday night. I don't know what that means. I, I do not know what that means. But uh, was he not listening? I don't know. But in any event, I, I, uh, Dr. Becker interviewed him for eight and a half hours. Uh, this was her first responsibility case. Um, I'm sure she felt that she did what was, she felt was sufficient. Although we're talking about, really, I think 20 instances of seriousness. Dr. Wallstrom interviewed him for 10 and a half hours, I believe, and maybe came back another time. Uh, but uh, he is a conscientious, newly emerged into the, into the uh, profession, and. Uh, uh, I'm sure he took it conscientiously. Dr. Berlin has never testified for the prosecution. I asked him, oh, doctor, you've been, the competency issue, you may recall, seven to nine times was the competency issue that Berlin said. He testified other times, child molesting cases at the disposition level of child molesting cases, where he would be there testifying, presumably about his program and what his program could do for the child molester. I asked him in all those years, I think he said he'd become a psychiatrist in 75 or 76 or 77. He's been the district, he's been out there for 15 years as a psychiatrist. I said, doctor, did you ever testify for the Baltimore City District of State's Attorney? No, I didn't. Did you ever testify for the Baltimore County State's Attorney? No, I didn't. Did you ever testify for any state's attorney in the state of Maryland? No, I didn't. How about the changeover of DAs that happens? that in any community where they're elected, there's a changeover in those 15 years. None of the district attorneys, the state's attorneys, have asked Dr. Berlin to testify. Well, doctor, what about in other states? No, no other state's attorney asked him to testify. What about for the federal government? No, Dr. Berlin is called upon to testify only by the defense. Important you consider that. 
especially when Dr. Dietz identifies him as being the only forensic psychiatrist he knows that advances the theory that a paraphilia is a defense on a responsibility charge in a murder case. Legitimate question to ask. He may be an intensely compassionate man wrapped up in treatment. In fact, there are several said, yes, I'd refer someone for treatment. No one said I would refer anyone, him for forensic, a forensic psychiatry, psychiatric evaluation. And does a person involved in treatment principally, a very caring man, do you over-identify sometimes? And that's the issue you have to ask. Do you over-identify? I want to tell you who I, I identify with. This has got to be done. Who are these people that died? You didn't see their relatives come in and testify because there was a guilty plea. You didn't hear the facts in great detail. I don't want you to forget it. I don't want you to forget who they are. Sometimes, and this is when I'm in my work, naturally I see people getting very concerned about a defendant, what's happened to a defendant. And because the victim is gone and dead, the victim isn't there to say, hey, what about me, what, what about me? Don't, don't forget Stephen Twomey, who died in the Ambassador Hotel with the defendant. Don't forget Richard James Doxtater on that board. James Doxtater, age 15, picked up by the defendant, age 15. Don't forget Richard Guerrero who died at the defendant's hands. Don't forget Anthony Sears, who died at the defendant's hands. Don't forget Raymond Smith, who died at the defendant's hands. Don't forget Edward Smith, who died at the defendant's hands. Don't forget Ernest Miller, who was stabbed to death by the defendant because he was becoming conscious. The defendant had to get a drink to do it. Don't forget Ernest Smith. Don't forget David Thomas, strangled by the defendant. Don't forget Curtis Strauder, strangled to death by the defendant. Don't forget Earl Lindsay, first drilled and eventually killed by the defendant. Don't forget Tony Anthony Hughes, first drilled and then extinguished by the defendant. Don't forget Conorak Synthesymphone, age as I recollect, age 14 for a couple of days of sexual pleasure. Conorak, synthesis phone, age 14. Don't forget Matt Turner, extinguished by the defendant. Don't forget Jeremiah Weinberger, drilled, who made it alive, struggled for life for a day and a half before he died at the hands of the defendant. Don't forget Oliver Lacey, dying at the hands of the defendant. Don't forget Joseph Bredehoft, dying at the hands of the defendant. His hands, those hands you've seen on that table, he wrapped them first, he drugged people so they couldn't resist. And that's being portrayed to you as a kindly act, a kindly act. He, he drugged him before he killed him. What a kind and considerate defendant. As I thought about preparing my final argument, I thought, remember, LP made it alive because he didn't have enough to drug him. He tried to hit him in the back, and LP got out. SS got out because he got out before the drugs took effect. Flowers got out because the grandmother saw him. But I thought to myself, is that a kindly act or a cowardly act to drug him before you kill him? Do you think if I asked each one of these men, each one of these young men, even down to the 14-year-old to the Conorak and the 15-year-old Dockstater, I said, look at, 
Would you like to take him on with your bare hands? Give him his knife and take him on. Every one of them said, my God, give me a chance for my life. Of course, I'd rather let him have his knife and I'll confront him barehanded and fight for my life. Foul and decent, vicious act to drug him first. So a man didn't even have a chance to reach out, to grasp for life, to reach out. That was no favor. Don't kill me by drugging me. My God, come at me with a knife or a gun. I'll fight for my life, but don't drug me. That's what he did. And then for three minutes, five minutes, Dr. Palermo said, for five minutes it takes to strangle the life out of a man. Five minutes. Want to do that? Shall we take it off? How long it takes to strangle a man to death? Try it in the jury room. Try it for five minutes. And everybody says he, except for Wallstrom, knew what he was doing, in touch with reality. Knew it was wrong. Knew it was wrong. Don't kill me with a drug. Please, give me a chance. Take a knife in each hand. Take a gun in each hand, but don't drug me before you kill me. That's no favor to me. That's no favor. Don't kid yourself. Told the police initially with, with David Thomas, his initial statement to the police was, I wasn't drawn to him, I wasn't sexually drawn to him, but I was afraid when he woke up he'd be angry. Quote, he'd be, quote, pissed off. So I killed him. Later on he changes his testimony, he said, no, he had sex with him. That's what he told the police. He'd be pissed off. And the second person, Raymond Smith, there was discussion about that too, being concerned about Raymond Smith, the man that's been referred to as Raymond Smith and Cash D. So with respect to the doctors for the defense, conscientious, I don't think you can do it in four hours and 45 minutes. I don't think you can do it in, in uh, for a man right out of school, can do it in 10 hours or 10 and a half or 12 or whatever you put into it. For a man that just finished his training, I don't think that's sufficient. And Dr. Becker, who was conscientious obviously, but has never ever testified, never wrestled with the issue of criminal responsibility. And she's treatment oriented. And that's good, that's good. But what we don't, we want, and they can understand a feeling. My colleague asked about using the name Jeffrey. Well, several other, several other people use the name Jeffrey. But she read that long thing where the name Mr. Dahmer, Mr. Dahmer, Mr. Dahmer appeared. I like people that are compassionate. But when I want an expert opinion, an independent, unbiased expert opinion, and then I want someone that can provide that. And the issue here is responsibility. Responsibility. Let's shift into the doctors. Dr. George Palermo, experienced, tremendously experienced man. He talked about his experience in Europe as an experience here in Italy. Talked about his first experience as a, when he was at a hospital in Colorado. Apparently some man that spoke only Italian got involved in a, in a slaying of some type, some incident where there was a court procedure. And at first you thought that somehow he as a resident got involved in this court proceeding. Uh, testifying, he said, oh no, and I asked him, oh no, 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 I wasn't, I was just in my training. He didn't testify on that, but he assisted in it. He heard a very candid man, he's a delightful man, you liked him, I liked him, you saw him here. He's, he's not, he's not, he's being forthright. He came in, he said, look it, I got the appointment, I thought, he must be crazy, he must be crazy, look what he did. But after he spent, he spent, I think he said a total of 12 and a half hours with him. He said, he is not insane, Jeffrey Dahmer is not insane. And he went in thinking, he went into kind of a bias that he must be. He said, no, he is not. Someone asked him about schizophrenia and he said, this is way beyond schizophrenia. Way beyond. A schizophrenic can do only certain things. And that brought to mind that you found an echo in that in Dr. Fosdell. Dr. Fosdell, psychiatrist, broad experience, testified across the state numerous times, 20 years. He said, Mr. McCann, the most bizarre cases I've seen in my practice are not by insane people, they are by, in, by sane people, not insane people. And he said, if you may recall, the mentally ill get bum-wrapped, thinking that this type, uh, that this is something out of mental illness. Don't bum-wrap the mentally ill by claiming, by finding that this man is mentally ill. 
as, 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 as Dr. Pal Palermo said, yes, he got problems. No one is saying he doesn't have problems. I'm not standing up here saying he's a healthy, healthy with no problems. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. He had strange sexual desires. He acted on them and killed to satisfy them. That's why we're here. He is not. And all of them, by the way, all of them said at least average intelligence. And several of them, I think Palermo was one of them that said, no, this man has a superior intelligence, not average, superior. His qualifications are extensive, broad experience. He's testified often on responsibility cases. Uh, many times uh, he provided his background, his teaching, where he's taught, how he's been affiliated, where he's an adjunct professor, and so on. He, as I see my notes here, he did speak. He did examine him for 12 and a half hours. He appeared to be of high intelligence, had a certain degree of emotional tranquility and easiness while discussing the matters at hand. And talks about the does not evidence any remorse. The memory was good. His speech was always coherent and relevant, and his ideas progressed logically. He was fully cooperative. His effect was appropriate to the situation. His memory for past and recent events was good. Goes on. Talks about alcohol. Most of them made, except for Dr. Berlin, who added it, but in their initial findings said he's alcohol dependent. And we've advanced that and argued it and submitted it. Then he talks about the incidences. Then he says this. The above was not part of a frenzied type of behavior. But was very, but but was every time the outcome of a calculated, prearranged plan that the defendant was able to carry out these heinous crimes. The defendant, again from Doctor Doctor Palermo, the defendant did not seem to have a great deal of remorse for his killings. He seemed to want to emphasize that lust and power were the basis of his actions. Lust. Someone should die for that. In addition, he concluded, it is my professional psychiatric opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty that the defendant, Jeffrey Dahmer, was legally sane at the time of the offenses he has been charged with. Indeed, he possessed substantial mental capacity to differentiate right from wrong, refrain from wrongdoing, appreciate the nature and quality of, that, of his actions, and conform with the requirements of the law. He wasn't hired by me. He wasn't hired by Mr. Boyle. He was hired by the court. The court will instruct you about appropriate weight to be given to a court expert, and you must abide by that instruction. But I submit to you, he's no hired gun for the defense. He's no hired gun for the prosecution. He said he's testified on both sides of these issues. Does the court want to break at this point? What would be this is comfortable. You're fine. Okay, we'll break for lunch at this point. We'll reconvene at 1.15. Court's in recess. All right. Be seated, please. Yes, we can. At what point should I stop speaking, Judge? Is it one? Uh, how much time do I have? Oh, I think you, if I recall, you have about an hour to an hour and five minutes left. Right, I, could. I shall stop at 2.30 then. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I'm, I'll be speaking until about 2.30. I know this is a tough time after lunch. I know it's tough for all of us, and I, I know this, the seriousness with which you view this. And. Uh, uh, I will have to speak rapidly because there's a great deal to cover, and I trust that my rapid speaking doesn't put you to sleep. The, we've, we've talked already about Dr. Palermo, and I've read his opinion to you that the defendant was fully responsible and that uh, did not lack substantial capacity and so on. Uh, the, next, uh, the second court expert was Dr. Uh, Samuel Friedman. Uh, he is a psychologist. He testified as to his expertise in the area. And uh, among the things that he did was uh, state the following as he read his report that in dealing with probable ideological factors, Mr. Dahmer implicates concepts of lust and control. Further, he said feelings of lust, particularly concerning adolescent youthful males of well-proportioned physique. And finally, his opinion was as follows. In addressing the issue of criminal responsibility, it can be stated that there is no substance to the NGI plea. That's not guilty by reason of insanity. No substance to, the, to an NGI plea. At the time of the alleged offenses, Mr. Dahmer was fully able to appreciate right from wrong and to conform his conduct to the dictates of the law. Now, it should be pointed out uh, that these are two very experienced men. You saw them. They're senior men, obviously. Uh, Palermo was a very broad experience, Friedman's broad experience and experience in life that came in as independent, independently appointed by the court uh, uh, and gave their opinion. 
there was a difference uh, uh, in, in some particularities. There was a difference between them on how they perceived the mental disease issue. And let me speak to that mental disease issue. Uh, a number of the psychiatrists testified that yes, there is a different perception within the profession of whether a paraphilia is a mental disease or not. That issue was knocked back and forth, and it's clear that there is a difference in the profession. You're going to get an instruction from the judge that it's up to you to decide what label. You really have a very broad discretion in determining what's a mental disease or not. The court will tell you that you're not going to be constrained by what any psychiatrist says, that it's going to be up to you to decide what's a mental disease or not, and the court will give you an instruction, an abnormal condition of the mind, and so forth. I don't see that as a big issue in this case. In this here, between the court experts, there was a split. Both of them said he is fully competent. Uh, both of them said that there's no merit to the NGI plea. He has the capacity to appreciate wrongfulness. He has the capacity to conform his conduct to the requirements of the law. Both of them ruled that way, and one said there's mental disease, and one said there isn't. It's up to you to decide. I don't, don't get hung up on it. My suggestion is don't get hung up on it because the definition that the court will give you, you decide it. You're not constrained by any label. To me, the real issue in this case is conformity. That's what we, uh, what the experts for the, both for, both of the experts of the court said that there is capacity to conform, capacity to appreciate wrongfulness. That's what our experts said. Uh, that is the issue really before the court is the defense has already conceded that uh, in effect uh, that uh, right from wrong the defendant knew. No psychiatrist took the stand and said the defendant didn't know right from wrong except maybe Wallstrom did. I don't really recollect Wallstrom, but certainly Becker and Berlin said he knows right from wrong. The, the experts from the court said he knows right from wrong. Our experts said he knows right from wrong. We discussed it with our experts down the line, particularly Dr. Dietz broke out every case on the right from wrong issue. And I don't think that's really an issue. And I think with the broad definition that the court gives you, you decide what's a mental disease. And I don't see that as a, as a hang up because the, the, the court experts and the state's experts said no, that the capacity to appreciate the wrongfulness and to conform is there. And I think that's the essential issue of the case. And I think to get hung up on the debate, say, between the court, the two court experts, is it a mental disease or not? The issue is capacity. Both of the court experts say yes, the substantial capacity is there. Friedman very bluntly says there's no merit to the NGI plea or whatever the, see what was the exact word, he rather forcefully uh, articulated. It's, there is no substance to an NGI plea. So to, to, I would suggest you not get hung up over the issue of, of the mental disease or not. The real issue is control. Uh, and even as the court's experts ruled that there was, believed there was, opined that there was control there, so do our experts, although our experts also see a difference on that issue, as psychiatrists do. So the critical issue isn't really whether we call paraphilia a mental disease or not, because you're going to decide that. And nothing the doctors say, as the court will tell you, is that you make that decision. You're not at all bound by what any doctor said. If all of them came in here together and said, this is not a mental disease, you still have the authority to say, yes, it is. Or if they all came in and said, it is a mental disease, you have the authority to say, oh, no, it isn't. So you have a very broad authority in that area. And the fact that doctors split as the, the court's experts split, as ours split, I would say don't make that, don't hang up on that because you have a very broad capacity to define mental disease and the real issue is conformity. I'd like to speak about citizen witnesses and, and their, their perception of the defendant. And we asked them basically the same questions as they testified. First, the ones that had the, the very extensive experience uh, with the defendant and that, that is at the place at which he worked. Mr. Benning and Mr. Uh, Haney who testified. They had had contact with him. He started in 1985 at the West Side Chocolate Factory, uh, worked there until no July of 1991. So you have an experience of six years there with the defendant. Day in, day out, what do you work? 2,000, there's 2,040 hours. Say you knock off a two weeks vacation, is 2,080 and a, a 52 week, there's 2,080 working hours. Say if you make it a four week vacation, knock it down to 1,900 plus, and the two men's vacations are different perhaps. You've got, but you've got about, you've got well over 1,900 hours a year that you're working there in over a six year period. And both of them came forward. And we asked, must have sounded like a litany to you, but it was the same questions basically. Did you see any delusions? Did you see any hallucinations? Did you see any incoherence? Uh, uh, any catatonic stupor of any type, any stupor? Was he able to relate his thoughts to one another? Did he have racing thoughts? 
was he out of touch with reality in any way? And they said no. They'd worked with him over all those years and said no. They've spent literally thousands of hours, more than Dr. Dietz, more than Dr. Fosdell. You can add up all the hours the doctors put together and they're a pint compared to the time that, that Benning and, and uh, Haney worked. And they're supervising him, they're watching him, they're relating to him, giving directions, watching how he's doing, and so on. So you, you have a, a tremendous birth of experience there. The court, as we indicated at Vaudeer, the court will instruct you on what weight to give lay witnesses. But goodness sakes, that's a lot of time to be with a guy who's claiming that he uh, should not be held responsible because of a, a uh, mental disease. That's a lot of time to spend saying, no, you see nothing like that. We didn't see anything like that. Nobody disappeared from the chocolate factory, none of the workers there. We also called some other people, Sopwell, Prince Well, Prince well Sopa, the manager of the, of the, where he resided, where he lived. We went right to where he lived, uh, talked to the manager that had had dealings with him. No, he said, no, he's uh, been a good tenant, not had trouble. In fact, which I want to be honest, surprised me, he said that's the, he had the neatest apartment in the building. This isn't a man living in a, okay, you ought to see my bedroom. Hate to say that. You might think that, hey, compare that apartment to McCann's bedroom. Uh, what we're saying is this isn't a, a, a wildly deranged apartment. Even with the activities that he was doing there, uh, uh, he said that. And others that visited, when the officers came in, in the midst of the Conorac involvement, the officers came into that apartment and said, no, it's basically a neat apartment. So that you, you have, here's a guy living alone. I didn't get married till I was 34. 34, a man keeping his apartment alone, clean, relatively neat. According to Sopwell, Prince Well Sopa, the neatest in his building, I submit to you is, is, is living a, a, is not a wildly disordered lifestyle. Uh, Sopa testified to his own education, how, how that he had seen him for the time. He talked to him from time to time about complaints about odors. Uh, the defendant responded to that. Sopa even considered going into business with him. Well, the, the, the question was put as an investor. Well, maybe everybody wants an investor in their business, but on redirect, the question was put, on redirect, well, did you anticipate that he would stop in and visit with your customers? And he said yes. Uh, so that, uh, and then he was put the question, did you ever see him with delusions, hallucinations, incoherent? Was he able to relate his thoughts to one another? Racing thoughts, was he in a stupor? Was he out of touch with reality in any way? He said, no, 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 That's, that was not Jeffrey Dahmer. We called also a man named Kyle Whaley, who on 7-12-91, the defendant had decided to increase his, uh, the barrels, he was gonna get, gonna get fired and develop the capacity to wipe out all the bones, the skulls, and everything if he chose to do that. Dr. Dietz talked about that, that he was weighing that, uh, whether he had laid in the muriatic acid, 16 gallons of muriatic acid, powerful acid, and was thinking of, of, of doing away with all the evidence the beloved, supposedly, skulls for the temple would be wiped out completely, flushed down the drain. He'd have walked out on July 31st with not a whit of physical evidence, not a whit remaining. That's why he got the acid, the bigger barrel, that's what he was thinking of. Whaley sold him that barrel and talked about him. They spent some time together. He seemed normal to Whaley, took him through the same questions. Delusions, hallucinations, incoherence, related thoughts, racing thoughts, stupor, out of touch with reality, said no. They talked about the different size of barrels, how they were, uh, and uh, uh, they completed the sale. We talked to a Mr. Alton from the hardware store, but to bring you right up to date, recently people talking with him as he was getting in the muriatic acid, a substantial quantity, uh, Alton said, yeah, it's almost wholesale bulk uh, to, to get that much. Of course, he not at all dreaming that this was going to be used to, to reduce down bones and possibly skulls down to pulp to get flushed down the toilet. We talked to the carpet cleaner that visited the home several times. He also spoke of it as a relatively <coughs> trim, uh, neat apartment and what transpired there, the d efforts of the defendant to apparently remove what was blood, uh, but telling him, no, it's, it's, uh, it is not blood, it's chocolate, uh, and he not knowing whether it was red wine or precisely what it was. So we presented citizen witnesses to you, a cross section of citizen witnesses. Again, I tell you, 10 years in this city and the defendant produced no one. That's important. That's what you call negative evidence. You don't just consider what our positive lay witnesses, you say to yourself, if he's been here 10 years, powerfully strange that no one says, hey, uh, this is what his situation is. I'd like to talk then uh, to Dr. Fosdell. Again, you forgive me if I'm moving at a pretty fast clip. Uh, Dr. Fosdell testified how he saw him starting back on October 16th. He saw him for five times. 
You know from that Saturday afternoon how exhausted he was, how careful in particular, 17 hours, went into each case, discussed each case, each incident, into the background, a, a very careful, professional, uh, uh, able practitioner, a day-to-day -day forensic psychiatrist in Wisconsin, has appeared throughout the state ex as an expert witness, had extensive experience earlier in his career. He told you he had worked at the, uh, on the, under the sexual deviant law at that time in Wisconsin. He had worked uh, up in the Waupon area and also in Madison at facilities where he processed and evaluated numerous sexual offenders or alleged sexual offenders referred by the courts. This is a man with a substantial experience in evaluating sex offenders. Uh, he advised what, uh, that his interviews, he read, read substantially from his notes. You could see what, a, what a, a careful worker he was and what his conclusion was, that this defendant did uh, have the substantial capacity to appreciate the wrongfulness of his conduct and, uh, of his, of, and, and to conform his conduct to the requirements of the law. We put on an expert that has done that hundreds of times, not someone that's here to talk about their first murder case. And uh, he was engaged by the state, contacted by me, said a day or two after, it, uh, uh, after this, these events unfolded, uh, and uh, consulted with us, and uh, stated that uh, he is most frequently appointed by the court. He is most frequently brought on by the court, although he might be recommended by one side or the other. But most frequently he testifies as a court-appointed expert. He said he approximated in about 25% of the time he supports the plea. In other words, about 25% of the cases that he's involved in, he comes in. In fact, I think as I recall that he said twice in the month of January, that in, in this county and twice in the month of January, he had returned findings that the person involved in the case was, was uh, met the criteria for uh, not being responsible under the law. Uh, this is, a, I submit to you, as an independent man of integrity, a thoroughgoing professional who demonstrated his commitment to doing this thoroughly. Uh, and uh, experienced, competent, and found that the defendant uh, had the substantial capacity uh, to, to appreciate the wrongfulness of his conduct and to comply his conduct with the requirements of the law. Some of the issues that he noted, I'll, I'll be touching on further as I directly address the issue of control, but some of the exact quotes out of his notes that might be of interest to you. Quote, it's kind of, quoting the defendant, it's kind of pathetic, it's my own fault. If I had chosen a different path, life would have been different. Further asked, when asked what he was blaming, the defendant said, I have one person to blame, the person sitting across from you. No one else, no one put a gun to my head. I had choices to make and I made the wrong choices. I could have made different choices in the past, it's obvious to me, if I had more foresight. Went on to say at one point, going to the bass houses, quote, kept me somewhat satisfied for a while. Uh, then started, uh, after he was closed out of the bath houses, uh, started looking around for greater satisfaction. Spoke, said he took two or three men back to grandmother's home, house whom he did not kill. Uh, they left later. When asked how he decided which ones he let go, he said, those that left I met while I was quite drunk. I lost my attraction to them as I sobered up. This a man with a sexual drive that's uh, you know, abnormal, a man that's able to control it. Because what he wanted from them was sex. Remember, it isn't the killing that he, that he takes pleasure in, it's the sex. During the, the period of pendency of the, of the uh, SS case, talks about a three month break, said he still had the desire, but there was, quote, too much legal activity going on, close quote, so he just used pornography and videotapes. When asked about the lapse in a certain time period, uh, he said he continued to engage in pornography and attended bath clubs in Chicago. Uh, said he was not going to engage in more homicide, was going to wait till he got his own apartment. I understood that uh, in, in discussion that he was sometimes, he said, said he was often, quote, too tired, close quote, or, quote, didn't have the time, close quote, to find another victim during the interludes said he did not have any planned times when he wanted to pick someone up again, just when he had the time, but admitted that the desire and the interest were there. Then uh, talking uh, about, uh, as Dr. Fosdell told you, and I'll dwell on it a little more carefully, how he never would take someone that had a car. Isn't that sexual desire? Talk about being able to control your sexual desire if you choose. I suppose if you thought about it for a while, about sexual desire, you know, 
I love you, I love you, honey, but uh, you got a car, or you don't have a car. That sounds like really overwhelming sexual desire, doesn't it? That's the desire. He could handle it, because he doesn't want to run a chance of being caught. Because if the guy had a car, as he told Fosdell, the car comes home and sits out in the street. He doesn't have a license, a driver's license, and the police would be suspicious if that car was there. Does that sound like overwhelming sexual drive? He would target them, see them leaving at the bar there. Yeah, I'd like that guy, get a guy alone, get him as the bar closes, go up. Does He has a car, sorry. Come on, get serious, get serious. Able to control your sexual desire to have a car or not. Let's not kid ourselves about what's going on here, planning it. Again, I remind you what Dr. Fosdell said, my most bizarre acts, the cases he's handled, where the most bizarre acts occur are not the mentally ill. Don't bum wrap the mentally ill with this type of a case. Dr. Deist, exceptional qualifications. I don't think you, you saw that curriculum vitae, it was handed to you. This is a man of extraordinary ability. I don't think that anyone could dispute that. Uh, he is uh, gifted, he's worked hard, he got his degree at, at John Hopkins, and he went and taught at the Harvard Medical School. That is a, a uh, tremendous thing for a young man coming out. They assigned him up to Bridgewater. He said they were trying to trying to change the bridge, the image of the Bridgewater Medical Hospital and, and it became where they're processing people or they're going into the courts. So he was involved in hundreds of evaluations of people going into court through the Bridgewater Hospital in the state of Massachusetts as he taught on the Harvard faculty uh, and in a the medical school there running that particular program. Uh, involved him in people, uh, hundreds of cases of people that were on their way to the courts that were passing through the Bridgewater Hospital. He was then said he was approached by the government to work on the team uh, in the Hinckley case and then worked uh, for a period of time on the Hinckley case. He then accepted a double involvement at the University of, Minnesota, of the University of Virginia where he was on both the law school and the medical school faculties law school and medical. You have an unusual combination. Here is a forensic psychiatrist invited at a respected law school, respected medical institute to be on both faculties. This is a man knowledgeable in the law and knowledgeable in medicine. A thoroughly, thoroughly qualified individual. Has he done a lot of work for the government? You bet. CIA, Mr. Boyle elicited those distinguished uh, cases, national cases that you've read about. Uh, then he talked about serial murder cases in which he has testified. But there's been more than one murder. He talked about the Arthur Shawcross case. He has written and researched in the area of serial killing. This defendant is a serial killer. He is a serial killer. This psychiatrist has testified in such case, has researched such case, cases and has written about such cases. You get it, who has been on a law faculty and a medical faculty, a uniquely qualified commentator on the legal scene and on the psychiatric scene. Uh, and uh, he is a top-notch individual. Towards the end of the day, the second day when Mr. Boyle was cross-examining, I must confess I had assumed because the defendant, and I'll said it again and again, I think I read it at the opening statement, uh, I can read it again on alcohol, the defendant said he was drunk every time he did it, he had drank. Well, I think maybe everybody relied on that. And Mr. Boyle put a question to him, this was late in, in, the, in this cross-examination. Well, doctor, have you always assumed that he was under the influence because of his statements? And he said, oh no, and he turned, pulled, there he was, his notes, flipped open the notes, Jeff Six, he quotes Jeff Six from high school, starts quoting from high school what happened at high school, what military discipline was levied on the defendant for uh, intoxication. I'll tell you, I, I just, I was taken aback myself as he started to go through incident by incident in the military, released from the military early, an incident back in Bath, Ohio, uh, where there was a resistance, a fighting, uh, a, a the tying, eventually tying in the absenteeism that there's been a correlation between drinking and absenteeism at the job. I'll tell you, I just, 
know about you, but this is, even though the defendant said repeatedly he had been drinking, the doctor didn't believe it. He, he, he elicited that. I invite you, I invite, I suggest to you, do you think Dr. Berlin could have done that? This is an extraordinarily competent who brought a lot of hard work to this matter and was able, was organized. He's knowledgeable. He's on that special paraphilia subcommittee uh, of the DSMR. Uh, he's knowledgeable in his field. Uh, he's practiced. Uh, this is a, uh, I, I think, an exceptionally gifted human being. He talked about the responsibility issue, and on each case, then, he broke it out, down through the case. Here's the evidence of knowing the wrongfulness. Here's evidence on the conformity issue. Detailed, write down every case. And I submit to you, when you're back, picking out the trees in the forest, is this, what is this one? This, you're going to remember, I submit to you, you're going to recollect that Fosdell and Dietz talked about each case, opined on each case. You will not find that. You can search till your eyes are sore, your memory, you're not going to find that about Dr. Berlin, who said, no, I see the forest. I don't need to go through the trees. I don't need to look at each tree. I submit to you, you have to look at each tree. And I, that was one reason why I wanted to be very, very thorough uh, in presenting my psychiatrist that they had done exactly that, that they had checked every tree uh, and opined on the basis of their examination of those trees. I'd like to talk about the issue of control, and I'm going to make this somewhat of a mix of historical. I'm premising some of this on Dr. Fosdell, some of it on, on uh, Dr. Dietz, and what you've heard. Let's talk about the, 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 the what's involved here, the Stephen Hicks matter. Whatever the defendant, whatever his paraphilic interests were at that time, there was no killing uh, until he was, this, this occurred in the summer of 1978, on or about June 20th, 1978. Uh, there would have been talk about a, a jogger. I listened carefully, and it was clear some of the doctors thought uh, that, that he had planned to kill the jogger. Some of them thought that he had planned to render the jogger unconscious. I don't think you can see that clearly. And either, as I recall, Dr. Becker's notes, it sounds like uh, the defendant told Becker unconscious. As I recall, Berlin thought it was going to be that he was going to uh, slay the man. But at any rate, the first slaying takes place, Stephen Hicks, in the summer of 1978. What happens after that? He finishes the summer in Bath, Ohio, and goes for the first quarter to the University of Ohio, oh, not to the University of Ohio, to Ohio State. We all know that the Midwestern land-grant college, we're talking like Madison, thousands and thousands of young people walking about many hundreds who must have met the physique, the interests of this defendant, and yet he doesn't slay anybody. There's no evidence of involvement in a sexual assault. The biggest thing that comes across is a lot of drinking during that time, but no involvement, no involvement in any sexual activities. He returns, uh, goes into the Army in, in uh, December of 1978 and goes down south to barracks, and of course, to, for a training period. Then over to Germany, uh, and is in Germany for uh, several years. Uh, there is evidence, as Dr. Dietz threw out, that he responded to his sexual needs by masturbating, by use of pornography, but no evidence that he initiated a sexual assault on anybody, no evidence that he killed someone to get their body, no evidence that the desire didn't continue. Presumably the desire continued, the paraphilic desires, but the defendant controlled them. It's a period of time that the defendant <coughs> controlled them, he did not act them out. Evidence of the control, control capacities of the defendant. He's released early because of drinking, and, and in March of 1981, goes down to Miami, Florida, Collins Avenue. I don't know if anybody in this jury has been on Collins Avenue, but uh, it's along the beach. He talks about sleeping on the beach. Florida, from March to September, must have been thousands of young men, young men walking around with the physique that attracted him, but he doesn't kill them. He does not involve himself in the sexual assault of any of those individuals. Returns to the city of Milwaukee, returns to Ohio. In, in Jan September or so, there was evidence that the, that the father brought him back up to, uh, he came back up to Ohio. No evidence of an assault in Ohio from September to December of 1981. In December of 1981, as I recall, there was testimony that cited it as December and some testimony of 81 and some that cited it as January of 82. He moved up here to West Dallas to his grandmother's house. And that time, 1982, takes a job at the, at the plasma blood bank. Again, the particularity of this Dr. Dietz, and it's an odd thing, he brings it out. He, he uncovered it and tells you, yes, he had an experience. He t drank the blood of a naked Native American. He brought that out. As I recall, no other psychiatrist brought that out. A thorough man. Question, well, what happened at the, at the, at the plasma 
company and what did you do and effective questioning and shares that with you, shares that item with you. Uh, and said no, he didn't like it and, and wiped himself off and, and uh, did, never did it again. Uh, but a, a, a man that, that feels that you may want to know that and brings that out to you, Dr. Dietz, as I recall, he is the only one that mentioned it. Uh, and of course he testified last. It wasn't as though someone suggested it to him by earlier testimony. He testified last. From that time, uh, he worked at the Plasma and was there for a year uh, and then left that job. Then there's discussion in 1983 and 1984, he's still living with the grandmother. Uh, he decides, becomes, falls under the religious influences of the grandmother. And his lifestyle changes substantially. He starts dealing, he says, quoted, uh, suppressing the fantasies, the paraphilic fantasies. Cuts back substantially on masturbating. Starts going to church, starts reading the Bible. This is a commitment, this shows control, shows his capability of suppressing when he wants to, when he wants to, suppressing the fantasies and suppressing other activities he might otherwise been pursuing. We have the incident in the library, the West Ellis Library. The guy drops a note in his lap, uh, let's uh, come on downstairs to the, live, to the bathroom and I'll give you a blowjob, a homosexual type of, uh, of proposition. Uh, the defendant at first shrugs it off, starts thinking about it, and then re-engages himself, uh, starts going to the porno shops, finds out about the bathhouses and the gay bars, and starts involving himself in that lifestyle. That's the defendant's choice. That is his choice, and that's what he does. Talked about it uh, as a choice that he pursued. He then uh, becomes involved in the bathhouse activities. Uh, several men want to have anal intercourse with him, and he doesn't like it. He submits to it, but doesn't like it. However, he likes the, the milieu, the opportunity to meet people there and to experience sex there. So he takes care of it. How does he take care of it? Goes and lies to a doctor about getting some sleeping drug, that he needs a drug. Uh, and starts doing it. You can set the date. There was testimony by Lieutenant Moiler about how many pills were bought at what times, and you can see where he was using him for the bathhouse work, and then you can see when he's buying him, when he's using him as a first step in the slaying of a human being. You can see uh, the many, many hundreds of pills that were involved, and he himself rarely using it, rarely using it. And uh, the defendant then starts drugging people at the bathhouses. That's a pretty, pretty rotten thing to do. Pretty rotten. Whether you approve of bathhouses or not, that isn't the issue in this case. I suppose whether you approve of doing that or not isn't the issue either. The issue is homicide. But it's a rather selfish thing to do, uh, come in and say, okay, especially when he doesn't like to be sexual, anal sexual intercourse, drugs the guy, then he does it. Then he does it on him. He has a close call. He said somebody uh, uh, almost dies. They've got to get him out to the hospital. He appreciates the danger of the drugging when one of the individuals has to be taken out to the hospital. Uh, from the drugging event. Uh, he's, he's out of the bathhouses now and starts going to the hotels. And he speaks of going to two hotels. And eventually in November of 1987, he's, he's, by the way, when he's drugging these guys, he's not killing them. There they are, they're helpless. He doesn't kill them in the bathhouses and he doesn't kill them in the hotels. And then we come into November of 1987 at the Ambassador Hotel. He's not charged with that count. I don't know what happened in that count. I don't know what happened with Mr. Tomey. There's no potty left. There is no corpus delecti for Mr. Mr. Tomey. No one can say how Tomey died. The defendant says he woke up and, uh, and there was Mr. Tomey with some, some uh, chest problems, dead. He had drugged him. Did he die from an overdose? I don't know. I don't know how Tomey died. Uh, but he was, his body was totally destroyed by the defendant, so there's no corpus delecti for the Tomey matter. The defendant then decides, in, in right at this period of time, this is November of 1987, well, however, that's, that's however, that is an issue in this case, how Tommy died. It's a fact, though, because you want to consider that in the psychiatric assessment. After this, the defendant decides he's not going to try anymore. He decides he's not going to try resisting. I don't know how well he's done resisting because he's been into the bathhouses, but he's not going to resist anymore. And here's, I say, not resisting. All of us got to try till the day we die. You got to try. And if it's a sexual interest that you have, uh, if you're drawn to the lady next door, or if you're drawn to children down the street, or if you're drawn to somebody you work with, uh, we gotta try. Uh, I'm 55 and I, my sexual interests haven't stopped. I'll be candid with you. And do you think I can stop controlling? I don't think so. But this defendant decides he's not gonna try anymore. He is not gonna try anymore. What is the price of not trying anymore? Not jeopardizing his marriage. That's bad enough, people do those things. The price for him is 
first to render people on drugs so he has enjoys the sex, and then to kill them, to continue for a couple of days of pleasure. And after that change, what happens? Right here, he talks about it with, I think, virtually all of the psychiatrists discuss this discussion, and on, we, on it comes. Whether it's discussed as urges or compulsion, I've talked about compulsion, and I'll read this again. What the pal paraphilia is, is a sexual urge, recurrent, intense sexual urges. That's what we're talking about. You've had paraphilia, if, if, it were, if you are drawn to your wife, you're single, the difference is the object. It's not to, I've had intense sexual urges. I assume the people in this room, most of the people in this room have had intense, recurrent sexual urges. That's very natural to have that. It's a paraphilia because the object is an unconscious person or a dead person. That's the difference. Not something super hypersexual, as Dr. Dietz said, normal sexual drive at the higher end, but within the normal range. And I'm sure there are probably people in that in this box that maybe have are beyond the uh, are in the higher end of the normal range. At any rate, and after this decision, what happens? James Dockstater, age 15. Sorry, Mr. Dockstater, I want a couple more hours of sexual pleasure. You are going to have to die to give me those hours of sexual pleasure. That's what we're talking about. That's what this case is about. So James Dockstater dies. He doesn't have a car. What's this chopping up stuff? You know, it's not a ritual. He said that. What's this chopping up stuff? Hey, that sounds strange. Chopped him up. He doesn't have a car. He already had an experience back in Bath, Ohio. Remember when he chopped up Tuomi? He stopped at 3 a.m. by the Bath, Ohio Police Department. They stopped. They think he's drunk. It's left of center. He, he, he told the psychiatrist, the officers even flashed it in. See the bags, the garbage bags in the back of the car. He's had an experience hauling Tommy's body back in 1978. He doesn't attempt to borrow a car to haul the body. He decides to destroy the evidence right there, and he is immensely effective at it. Immensely effective. Acidifying, eventually his acidifying process, immensely effective at it. And as I say, at the end, he could have done it all. With the muriatic acid he had, the 57-gallon barrel, he could have wiped out all traces of all these people. And as Dietz told you, he was thinking precisely of doing that. Next Guerrero. He has decided, and he proceeds to do it. Next Guerrero, and he kills Guerrero, and uses the same drugging. Ronald Flowers, this is very important and very interesting. Ronald Flowers, I think there's, there's a little doubt that he intended to kill Ronald Flowers even as he had brought home Dockstader and Guerrero. What about, neither of these men had a car. Flowers had a car. Remember, Flowers testified. Couldn't get his car started. He was with his friends at the, the, the club, club down in the area. Couldn't get his car started. Goes up to the telephone, he's gonna make a phone call, and who approaches him? The defendant, Dahmer. They're talking, oh, I can't get my car started. Dahmer says, come on, we'll grab a cab home. I'll take my car and come back and jumpstart you. Dahmer doesn't have a car to come back and jumpstart him. He doesn't have a car. What do you think Dahmer had in mind to do with, you saw Mr. Flowers. I would not wish to confront Mr. Flowers when he was angry. You saw him testify. The defendant, don't come on out to my place and uh, you know, I'll, we'll jumpstart, I'll get my car, we'll come back and jumpstart your car. And out they go to his house and of course he drugs Mr. Flowers. Mr. Flowers said as he came in the house, he heard an older voice say, is that you, Jeffrey, the grandmother? At any rate, Mr. Mr. Flowers is drugged and uh, passes out, comes to in the hospital, comes to in the hospital. And the defendant with the psychiatrist tells what he had done, that he had sex with him, that somehow or somewhere the grandmother came along and either saw, somehow came to light that he was there, that that other man was there, Flowers was there. That saved Ronald Flowers' life. And the defendant didn't proceed, didn't wait till the grandmother left the house or what, got him out of the house. And this happens in other cases where there's some, something, the thing, the plan goes awry, changes, changes its plan. The plan was to kill, it's, the stroke is underway. The grandmother apparently saw Mr. Flowers. Mr. Flowers is alive by that chance alone with the grandmother. Otherwise, the defendant, and the defendant's ability to change, change the plan. Then the sexual assault that transpires. Here there is a five month period where the defendant is not involved in any assault. Sexual assault of SS. He testified, you saw him here, 
You were passed, I remind you, you were passed a stipulation, not identifying him by name, but you know his particular relationship to another victim. You're aware of that. And SS is invited on the street a 13-year-old boy. This was on September 26, 1988. You saw him here in court, and you saw how slight he is now. And that's two and a half years ago. You decide yourself what he would have looked like. He invites him in. Is this 13-year-old lad with a $50 offer and proceeds to drug him too. Takes pictures, takes a hold of his penis, takes it out, takes some photographs and slips him the drug. And the kid realizes that, that, that something is awry and gets up and leaves and Dahmer says, no, I've got to pay. And the kid goes home, drug winds up in the hospital and the police become involved. I asked Dr. Berlin, what did he intend to do to SS? And he said, kill him. He told Dr. Becker he intended to go to work that night and uh, that he would, uh, wasn't gonna kill him because he had to go to work that night. That's what he told Dr. Dietz and Dr. Fosdell. He was at work that night, we know that because that's where he was arrested. When the youngster called the police, Gary Temp testified, the officer went out to the house after he'd come back from the hospital, so Good Samaritan Hospital, interviewed the kid, took the kid down to the apartment building, identified the, uh, the, the de defendant's apartment, went to the manager, got the name and the work site, and they went out and arrested Dahmer at the West Side Chocolate Factory at one or two that morning. This is the, on the 27th of September. It's on this day when he was arrested. What happened there? The defendant exercised control. Either he decided that he was gonna go to work, and didn't want it, or he decided that he wouldn't attack this youngster because the youngster hadn't fully gone under the drug. In either event, he made that decision. Sexual drive, I can only analogize it to a woman, let's say, but honey, I love you, but I gotta go to work tonight. And I'm, uh, sexual, you know, capacity to control. Or was it he didn't want to struggle? Relatively slight young man, he didn't want to struggle with him. Wouldn't run the risk even though it was minutes before that drug would take place, didn't want a struggle that might call someone's attention to what was going on. So SS, by, that, by virtue of that drug making it out of the house, SS does not die. On 130.89, there is a plea. That while this case is pending, the defendant is eventually sentenced on May 23, 1989. He talks about running into Sears, Anthony Sears whom we like. Jeff Connors testified, the man that drove the car out they had met, he said he and he was with Sears. Sears met with Dahmer, and he gave them a ride out. Notice where he dropped off, though. He said, well, they dropped off, and he gave the, the, the intersection. When Officer Yaki testified, he said that intersection was about two or three blocks from the grandmother's house. There you have direct confirm, confirmation. Not just the defendant. And I read to you how he said when it was a cab, he always got out. Here he gets out. And you see the effectiveness of that because Connor came back and looked and they couldn't find out. Remember, I think he said with the sister of Sears trying to find out what happened to Sears. And the, it was effective. Being dropped off blocks away was effective. Where do you look? Blocks away. Flowers had said that too. You may recall Flowers said when they rode out in the cab, what is this? He's got to walk a couple of blocks before they get to the grandmother's house. So even the cab driver would know what had transpired. In any event, he is sentenced and uh, I will read in a few minutes from the transcript of that sentence because I want to remind you. In terms of control, from this period on, from the, the, from the 25th of March, 1989, until the 20th of 90, that's 14 months, there are no more slayings. No more slayings. During this time, the defendant serves nine months at the House of Correction. Nine months of those 14 months, he's at the House of Correction. Five months, he is not at the House of Correction. During that time, he slays no one. He's released every day. He's, he's released uh, to go to work. Control comes back. He could say, I'm just overwhelmed. I've got to go out and get a dead body. But he doesn't do that. He does not do that. On Thanksgiving Day, he's out, starts drinking, meets a man who, and he said how, he, the psychiatrist said how he, he was drinking that night, and, and I think it was that Thanksgiving, and winds up being hogtied himself with some man putting a candle up his rear end. Uh, in, in an odd turn, twist of the tables, he becomes the victim of another man's exploitation. But in any event, for that 14-month period, nine of which he is released to go to work, no evidence of sexual assault, control, because he has decided not to have that. And he mentioned somewhere along the line, he's waiting till he gets his own apartment. 
He gets his own apartment. Soapwell testified, as I recall, in early May, the defendant gets his own apartment on North 25th Street. During the pendency of this matter, he said he, after, after this arrest, shortly thereafter, he went back to the grandmother's house. Then he's at the house of correction. In early May of 1990, he gets his apartment on North 25th Street. And after that, Raymond Smith is the first victim. He's got his own circumstances, his own arrangement, and we start through the slayings. He becomes more effective at it. Let me talk a little bit, some of the things, some of the pattern here of these slayings. He could stop when he wanted to. He saw the long periods when he did not, when he chose to not to engage in these activities. Dr. Dietz asked him, he told Dr. Dietz that at the time he had killed each of these 15 victims, he would have refrained from doing so if a witness had entered the room. The fact that Dr. Mr. Dahmer was able to suppress his sexual behavior other than occasional masturbation for a prolonged period of time in 1983 and 84 when he was with the grandmother. The fact that Mr. Dahmer was able to satisfy his sexual desires with masturbation at all times. Not full, complete, but substantial satisfaction. The fact that Mr. Dahmer did in fact satisfy himself exclusively with masturbation from about 1973 until the murder of Hicks in 1978 and from that time into the entry of the homosexual subculture of the bathhouses, etc. In other words, the time he was in the military, the time at Ohio State, all those periods of time he was choosing to exercise control. The fact that Mr. Dahmer prepared himself for some of the murders by clearing spaces in an apartment by powderizing tablets, I've already read from the police report about that, before going out to find a, a victim. By drinking, by viewing pornography, by viewing the films. He talked about, Dr. Testa, testified how he, who of the psychiatrists took the time to view the Jedi film and the Exorcist III film? Who of the psychiatrists? One psychiatrist, Dr. Deese. He knew what he was talking about when he showed, let's see that film, let's see what portion of that film no other psychiatrist. That's what thoroughness is. When I asked you, would you consider experience and thoroughness, that's what thoroughness is. Show me these films. And Dr. Deese saw those films. He was knowledgeable about them when he formed his opinion. No other psychiatrist did. Mr. Bo Mr. Boyle started talking about these films and what they were doing and so on. Dr. Deese saw them. Dr. Berlin didn't talk about it. Dr. Becker didn't talk about it. None of the other doctors talked about it, but Dr. Deese did. That's why, that's why, when you talk about thoroughness, you're talking about a master when you talk. Because if these films are important enough to Mr. Boyle to argue about them, why didn't his psychiatrist look at them? Dr. Deese did look at them to see what role or influence they might have. The fact that Mr. Dahmer, Dahmer, Dahmer generally limited his murders to weekends when he would have sufficient time to enjoy and initiate disposal of the victim before returning to work. The fact that Mr. Dahmer did not kill any of the men he was attracted to while in bars or on the street or at the mall or the peep show booth or pornographic bookstores or in the bathhouses. He didn't, this is the man, when he said he would go out, if he couldn't find a guy with a car, without a car, he'd go back home. Not that he'd start prowling the streets, driven, overwhelmed by sexual desire, prowling the streets to get a man. Not the way he operated. Tightly controlled. His place, get him in, drug him, do it. No car, tightly controlled. Not so, you know, I can't get a man tonight, I'll go out in the streets and look in the alleys and get someone. Not that, that's what control is about. That's what control, decision to do that. The fact that Mr. Dahmer did not kill these men whom he found attractive and had rendered unconscious even after lowering his own inhibitions through drinking where the bathhouse setting would preclude readily, readily escaping detection. In other words, in the bathhouses where they were unconscious, the hotels up to the Tumi incident, not involved in any slayings. Even during these times, uh, Fosdell pointed out in his testimony from his notes discussion that when they got backed up in Milwaukee, if there were too many bodies, he'd go down to Chicago, the Chicago bathhouses. And you heard that man testify uh, from the Chicago bathhouses. He brought that evidence that he was registered down there the number of times he went down to the Chicago bathhouses and, and, uh, and took care of his sexual needs in that way. Again, not violating the law, taking care of his sexual needs. The fact that Mr. Dahmer did not kill many a drug unless he continued to find them sufficiently attractive to warrant further steps. Indications, of particularly from Fosdell, as I recollect, Dietz, and that if he sobered up and didn't like these guys, that was it, he didn't proceed to kill them. The fact that Mr. Dahmer reported that after rendering each of his victims unconscious, 
He voluntarily drank additional alcohol for the purpose of overcoming his natural inhibitions against killing them. The fact that Mr. Dahmer did in each instance wait until the victim was in his place of residence, under his control, and behind closed doors before killing the victim. There are no slayings on the street. And even uh, when I'll talk about LP in a few minutes, even Tracy Edwards, he doesn't chase Tracy Edwards down the hall. When Tracy Edwards is outside the apartment, boom, that's it, not a pursuit. And, and the, the testimony from Fosdell indicating that when he was, if he'd be tired, he wouldn't do it. If he'd been working all week, he wouldn't do it. If the person would have cooperated with him and stayed, this is what happened to Weinberger. Weinberger is a guy brought up from Chicago. For two days, the guy stayed for two days. The first day, he doesn't hurt him. The second day, he drills him, because Weinberger starts talking about going home. So it's not the first day, he delays it, and he prefers, he's indicated, he prefers them alive and compliant. Uh, and again, as I've said before, which to me is that he, the guy doesn't own a car. That's, that to me is a, well that, that you can see the control that he exercised throughout. This is not a man ravenously searching about. And even when, he, when it started to step up, in terms of his own, of his slayings, he doesn't vary from that. He doesn't attack anybody on the street. Uh, he, he continues, let, let me speak at this time also to the Flowers case. I've talked to that to some extent. Uh, you can see where he decided that he would not proceed with Flowers. The SS case, that's the Lad 13. Uh, by the way, after he was arrested, you heard Tempe and Schaefer. I've talked about citizens, lay witnesses testifying uh, that, that he seemed rational and so on. Officer Tempe testified. He was involved in two incidences with him. Uh, the incident at the, uh, the arrest, the investigation of the SS case, and several months later, when the defendant himself was, was struck over the head, uh, that officer was involved. Two separate times, Tempe had contact with him. Lieutenant Schaefer testified about he was involved in the arrest. You think an arrest is a, if a person was, was uh, on the edge. Here's an arrest, a very dramatic experience. The defendant was arrested. Schaefer talked about it, talking with him, went out to the home, recovered the drugs, uh, and uh, the defendant, I asked about that, both those officers, no delusions, no hallucinations, no incoherent, was able to relate one thought to another, no racing thoughts, was not in a stupor, seemed to be completely in touch with reality. Those are both those officers involved. The, the, the young lad himself, SS, described it. Nothing unusual about that behavior uh, that uh, he described, that SS the defendant, other than what the defendant did with his penis. Of course, the boy didn't know that he was being drugged at the time. In terms of the, of the LP case, again, in juvenile, uh, he has not testified, uh, but there has been substantial testimony about what Mr. Dahmer has said about that, and it will be on that testimony. Particularly, I'm referring now to the police reports that were read to you by Officer Murphy in the opening days. Uh, Dahmer, had met, Dahmer said he had met this, uh, this young man, 15, and spent the night with him the night before. Yeah, and he let, let LP leave, and they agreed that they would meet at 12 the next day and that he, Dahmer, would give him money for the previous night's activity. In other words, it didn't kill him the first night. It didn't kill LP because they agreed to meet at 12 the next day. Dahmer went on to say he took that to mean 12 noon, he went to look for, for, for LP, didn't find him. Came back to that same bar later that night thinking maybe it was midnight, and in fact does see LP there. Uh, earlier in the day, because Dahmer said he was out of prescriptions, Early in the morning, he went to the Army-Navy surplus store on West Wisconsin Avenue where he bought a plastic hammer, Mr. Dahmer did. He stated that he bought this hammer and planned to use it to strike Mr. Panetta on the head, sorry, I'm sorry, Mr. LP on the head in order to render him unconscious so that he could strangle him and make him one of his victims. This is Mr. Dahmer telling the police. Buys the hammer so he can render him unconscious so that he could strangle him and make him one of his victims. He's had one pleasant night with him, going to meet him again, and decides he's going to do him in. 15-year-old boy. Approximately 2.30 a.m., he again saw LP standing inside the Phoenix Tavern. At this time, LP agreed to accompany him back to his apartment, and they took a cab. He stated that once at the apartment, they again engaged in sex, which involved kissing, masturbation, and oral sex. He then wanted to take some pictures. Then he asked LP to lie on his face on his bed, and he could take some pictures from the bed. At that time, Mr. Pla Dahmer took out his plastic hammer and struck LP in the back of the neck in an attempt to render him unconscious. However, he was not rendered unconscious. A, 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 a fight ensued to some extent. Mr. Dahmer, the only reason he, but Dahmer tells him, it says LP got angry and got up, at which time a small argument ensued. 
Dahmer stated that the, he gave LP a reason, thought he, LP was going to take $200 from him. LP was angry, did not buy that explanation, and left stating that he was going to call the police. LP does this. Mr. Stammer stated that LP, in fact, left the apartment in the apartment building. However, approximately 10 minutes later, he heard pounding on the outer apartment lobby door, and when he went to investigate, LP was standing there requesting to get back in and asking for money. Here's a 15-year-old boy. Imagine, not knowing, not appreciating the danger. Uh, and he had seen Dahmer. He had been attacked by Dahmer. He was expecting that Dahmer's got this fulminating, uh, he goes back. He's a 15-year-old boy. Mr. Dahmer stated that at this time, LP followed him back to his apartment. And once inside, Mr. Dahmer grabbed him by the neck and attempted to strangle him, and a fight ensued. This is the Mr. Dahmer that always tells you he drugs people. Not in this case. With LP, he attempts to strangle him. He decided earlier that LP was going to be a victim, and a fight ensued. He related that they fought for a couple of minutes when Mr. Dahmer simply stopped fighting and decided to calm the situation by saying, let's talk. And they agreed, they talked for a while, they talked for several hours. Mr. Stubb Dahmer, the young lad let Dahmer bind his hands behind his back. However, not very tight, and they continued to talk. Dahmer indicated that during the next half hour or so, LP wriggled free from the extension cord, he had tied on his hands, and attempted to leave the apartment when Mr. Dahmer, in fact, grabbed his six-inch bladed black plastic-handled knife. This is Dahmer grabbing a knife, LP's gonna leave again. He stated that he believed that LP thought that this was a gun and decided to sit down again. He related that they began to talk and talked approximately until 7 a.m. Here's the point. Mr. Dahmer stated that during the talk, he was trying to convince LP not to tell the police about the night's activities, and he continued to apologize for striking him with the hammer. Mr. Dahmer stated that though he, had, he did intend to kill LP and make him one of his victims, that because of the previous night's sexual activities and that fact that they had spent hours talking, he began to sober up and know Mr. Panay, strike that, know Mr. LP on a more personal level and had decided that he would not kill him. A decision not to kill him. Talk about, talk about walking into the jaws of death, the youngster going back after he'd been struck by a hammer. But the defendant, not, not capable when he's personalized, I think it was Fosdell that testified how the defendant would make objects of people, didn't want to get to know them, didn't want, you heard the initial police testimony, he didn't know their names even. Caught this body, this person, that person, most of their names he didn't know. A few IDs had been recovered, uh, but uh, most of the persons he did not know. LP, gets them, he deliberately objectified them because they were going to be father for his sexual desires. He was going to kill them. In terms of, of uh, the Conorak case, like that, yes, Conorak sent to some phone. That incident, because I think that again shows control, substantial control. He takes in Conorak, meets him, I think he said at the mall, pays him, and promises him $50. He's a 14-year-old boy, 14-year-old boy. Takes him to the apartment, gets him in there, has him pose. You know he posed because the police saw the pictures and he was conscious while he posed. He says then he drugged him, drugged the boy, and drilled a hole in his head. And then went out himself, Dahmer, uh, slept for a while as I recall. He said then he went out for some drinks, leaving, leaving Connor accents to some phone there in the apartment. He's at the tavern a while, he's coming back, uh, and uh, sees uh, Connor exits his phone sitting on the corner naked. The young man has gotten out of the house despite this, uh, despite the drilling, apparently a small bit. But uh, there he is, he's under the, obviously he's been drugged and he's, he's uh, had a, a, an involvement. You may recall Weinberger also lived a day and a half. I think he indicated that Weinberger made it beyond. Uh, several of them apparently survived the, the drilling for a period of time. Uh, the longest, of course, was Weinberger, who made it a day and a half, as I recall. Um, there he sees him. He goes up to him. There are some people there already. Uh, he talks about going up to them, and it's after he's with them that the police arrive. They find him in the alley there. The squad car pulls in. Gabrish and Balserzak testified. There he is. The defense is painting him as a wild man out of control at this time. That's not the description of the police. Not a wild man out of control. It's calm. 
Now, that's a tough. He's written this out before. This is not his first time. After Flowers, you may recall, after the Flowers incident, first of all, let's go back even to Hicks, when the police stopped him with Hicks' body chopped up in bags in the back of the car. The defendant gutted his way through that, persuaded the police, and they let him go. In the Flowers case, Officer Yaki testified that Flowers, after he recovered in the hospital, filed a complaint, and Yaki went out and talked to the defendant. No, he didn't do that. The defendant later admitted he had stolen $80, as well as drugging Flowers, but uh, he persuaded Yaki. No, 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 that's, that's not so. And here he is again, calmly, with the police. No, this man is a friend of mine. Uh, he's, we're friends. Uh, he's living. His name is John Hamung, uh, and he's calm. He's orderly. He's been drinking. Not drunk, does not appear to be drunk, but he's apparently, <coughs> by his own testimony, was drinking. Uh, and uh, the officers talk with him, and they are persuaded by him. These are not veteran; these are veteran officers. That they, I asked them how many years you've been on the force. These aren't kids that started last week. Balsers Act, particularly, who talked with him, who initially talked with him there in the alley. And then Balsers Act turns to the group: Is there anyone here that knows this man? And certainly Dahmer heard that no one responded. And he would know now that no one knew who he was with. And back they go, the officers, Gabers testified, they walked back up the alley into the apartment, into the living room. He also describes it, as did Mr. Uh, Sopa, Prince Will Sopa. Neat apartment. While they walk in, the officers walk in. It's orderly. There are the clothing laid on the, on the couch. Uh, and here, the one officer, Perubkin, finds the pictures. And they're, 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 you saw the mark, they've been put into evidence. There's the young man posing. They said he's awake, standing. This is not the posing of a man unconscious. And, and the defendant is cool and collected and handles the police as he's done it before, as he's done it before. Does this sound like a man out of control? Does this sound like a man out of control with a neat apartment, persuading veteran police officers? Calm, collected, persuasive. That sound to you like a man out of control? Doesn't sound like a man out of control to me. Persuades those officers and they leave. Uh, and then he proceeds later. Did he kill Conorak? What did he do? Drill him again? Put acid in? Or strangle him? He knew the police would not know. You know, they had thought of it. I had it down that John Hamon had not seen identification. Uh, and uh, he defleshes, defleshes Conorak, saves the skull. Is there some risk in that? Yeah, there's some risk. That's a memento. That's a memento for him. There is some risk. But here's a guy that's running risks. And he talks on, and, and it was read to you, uh, how at the point, he was at this point. Talks how he said it was a friend of his uh, to the ladies that were there and uh, proceeds to talk, testify. He stated that the victim told the police that the victim was in fact a close friend of his and gave a fake name. Uh, he fooled the officers as he had fooled the officers before. As he, as he had fooled Yaki as he had fooled the police in, in uh, uh, in the end, of course, uh, uh, the young man himself could not speak, was apparently damaged by the, either by the drug or by the drilling, uh, and he persuades the police that, uh, uh, fools the police, I think is the honest way to say it. Listen to this, what he has to say. This is a man that the defense is arguing is out of control. What does he think to himself? Regarding the incident with the police, this is from the, the confession, regarding the incident with the police and the Asian boy, Connor accesses some phone, he related that although he was extremely nervous during the time of the questioning by police, he put on a very calm attitude and felt he was able to convince the police that it was a lover's problem between two homosexuals. He stated that due to the fact that he was able to convince all these people in positions of authority, his parents and neighbors who questioned him regarding his activities, it gave him a feeling that he could get away with his crimes. He felt that he had the ability to make people see a phase of him that only he wished them to see and that this encouraged him to continue on with his crimes, feeling that he would not be caught. That's the man that they're claiming was out of control at that time. I must move very expeditiously as I do not have much time. Please. Mr. Boyle will speak again. Remember, I, the, the time is short, but I've cut you to know so much more in terms of certain issues. What about cutting up the bodies? That sounds strange. That's how he was getting rid of the evidence. He said he didn't like it, said it was tough work. The only person that suggested otherwise was Dr. Berlin. He said the ritual. I said, did he ask him that? He said, no, he just decided, Berlin decided on his own without asking the defendant. The defendant to everybody else said, no, chopping it up was dirty work. He didn't like it. But he had a real plan to get rid of the evidence, and boy, he did. What about the temple? Let's talk about the temple for a minute. All the doctors, at least as I recall, most of the doctors spent time considering that. All of them want to know, was this a delusion? And all of them except Wallstrom, all of them said no. 
He is not, may have a strange idea here, but not delusional, not psychotic, not hallucinating, uh, except for Wallstrom. But each of the doctors considered that. Maintaining the temple is, is not the charge that's here, the charge is murder. In terms of body parts, Dr. Teets testified there was some backup, uh, some skeleton he wanted to keep, uh, and there was some backup from the activity that he was doing. Again, the doctors looked at it with the exception of Wallstrom. All of them said he was not psychotic. And with eating, the same thing with eating. Yeah, that sounds strange. He's not on, on trial here for eating. Let's remember that. Oh, eating. It's the issue of the slayings that brings us here. Not the issue of eating, not the issue of having sex with a corpse. It's the issue of the killings that he didn't, that wasn't part of his sex pleasure, that he did. A dirty step, I think, or a bridge, as, Fos as Fosdale referred to it, to accomplish what he wanted, to have sex, to continue the sex you know, with these. The alcohol, I don't think we need to go over it, but briefly, when he went to the police and the confession, he stated that when he killed these individuals, he was always drunk. And the drinking helped him get into the frame of mind that made it easier for Tim. He related that he even drank when, his, when he was cutting up the bodies. And he again stated that it helped to make it easier when he was doing this. In terms of the last three men, what he did with the last three men, Jeremiah Weinberg, he picked up in Chicago at, a, at a, the Carroll's Bar in Chicago, persuaded him to come back to Milwaukee. You think that was a madman? Persuaded Jeremiah Weinberger to come from Chicago? A wild-eyed madman, out of control? He persuaded another adult male to come back to Milwaukee with him spent a couple of days with him before he killed him, two nights. So, and the defendant continued. With respect to Oliver Lacey, meets him on the street, 27th Street, about 3 p.m. on a Sunday afternoon, uh, brings him back. Uh, is that town? Here's the Oliver Lacey uh, on the street. You think he, Oliver Lacey went along with a madman, a wild man out of control? Doesn't do anything, gets him back like Weinberger, back to the apartment, same plan, gets him drugged, does nothing on the street, uses the drug, gets him under, strangles him whether he was still using the strap that he brought specifically to strangle people. You may recall he brought a strap specifically to strangle. Whether he used that on, on uh, Lacey or not, I don't recall. Joseph Bredehoff again, saw him down on the near west side waiting for a bus, induces him to come from the near west side to his apartment. Drugs him, same pattern, waits till he gets in the house. Does that sound like a man out of control? Bredehoff and Lacey and Weinberger persuaded by a man out of control? Come on, get serious. What about the Tracy Edwards incident? Well, I had no, no quarrel with Tracy Edwards' direct testimony except for one thing, when he said rocking and chanting. And that wasn't in the police report, and we know it wasn't. And then he had been on the Donahue show, and then what he said on the Donahue show, wild exaggeration. Eight locks, we impeached him directly on that. There weren't eight locks. That was a four times exaggeration. Take the reality, exaggerated four times. Tracy Edwards said he had gone out to the apartment for $100. He was weighing whether he would pose for $100. Now, he's going to do that for $100. I asked him, what would you get paid to be on the Donahue show? He said, my lawyer handled that. Did you ask him? No, I never asked him. Come on. Come on, Mr. Tracy Edwards. You pay 100 bucks. You need that money to come out here to pose. He said he didn't think it was going to be a homosexual. He doesn't know what he got for being on the Donahue show or the Geraldo show? You know, really, I think that's... Uh, has sued the city for a million dollars over this incident, Mr. Tracy Edwards has, as he, as he had been indicated to you. And I, I submit to you, I'll take what he said on direct examination. He didn't say anything about Rocky. He had a knife, yes, we know a knife because LP, he used a knife on LP, and I'll buy what Tracy Edwards said about the knife. He used a knife on Ernest Miller to kill him, and I'll buy what, what LP said on that. Did he watch the Exorcist film? Yes, I'll buy what LP said. Did he threaten, strike that, I'll buy what Edwards said. Did he threaten Edwards? I'll buy what Edwards said but not the other stuff, not the rocking and the chanting. I, say, I submit to you, Tracy Edwards stands impeached by a number of grounds. But in speaking on the, on the stop trying, I said to Dr. Berlin, I asked him from John Hopkins materials, I said, admit, uh, I asked him, is, it, is this in the materials for the Johns Hopkins Hospital? I quoted the following. Admittedly, sometimes it is difficult to determine whether a person is trying their best and failing or just not trying. I said, doctor, isn't that in the John Hopkins material for your clinic? He said, yes, I wrote it. Here's a guy that said he quit trying. He quit trying, and he wants you to get, say, no responsibility, sir. Just quit trying, because you've got this thought, this paraphilic thought, so you can quit trying. That's okay. That's what you're being asked to buy. There's much more I'd like to cover, and I can't. There are two things. I have three minutes. I'm going to speak to two things. Burden of proof. I remind you, I won't drive a, a nail in your ear. 
I remind you the burden of proof is not mine. I opened these remarks with that, and I, I one more thing, and I'll close them with this. And that is, I don't have to prove he's sane. The defendant has to prove that he is, by reasonable certainty, by the greater weight of the credible evidence, that he is insane. I don't have to prove he's sane. If they fail to prove that to you, if you say, God, I don't know what he, hey, look at these doctors, I don't know, I don't know. They're, or you might, if you say he's sane, it's easy. But if you don't know, then they haven't met their burden of proof. You don't vote to say is he sane or not. You vote to say has he proven to a reasonable certainty. If he hasn't proven it to a reasonable certainty, then you say no, and the lawsuit is resolved that way. In terms, finally, I've captioned this, don't be fooled, my don't be fooled file. He fooled Dr. Olson, and he fooled others to get drugs to use to drug these people. He fooled the police in Bath, Ohio. He fooled the police when he had Hicks' body in his car. He fooled the West Dallas police on the Flowers complaint. He fooled the Milwaukee police on the counteract Simpson Dome case. Uh, and and uh, uh, he, he uh, in terms of the time the police came in looking for a dead body, you may remember, broke into in the apartment building, broke into a, his D set two doors down, broke in because Mr. Sopa thought there was a dead body, someone had died. They hit the wrong apartment. That was a, a mistake as well. I want then the final, I want to read, read from a transcript of May 23rd, 1989, when the defendant was being sentenced on his sexual assault of, Connor, of, uh, of SS, the sexual assault of SS. And that's been quoted, and I'm going to read it to you again. This is the defendant now at his sentencing on the SS, on the SS incident. The prosecution has raised very serious charges against me, and I can understand why. What I've done is very serious. I never meant to give anyone the impression that I thought otherwise. I've never been in this position before. Nothing this awful. This is a nightmare come true for me. If anything would shock me out of my past behavior patterns, it's this. He's meanwhile killed Doc Stater, Doc Stater, uh, uh, Mr. Guerrero, and Mr. Sears. He's, and he's now talking before the court. This is a nightmare come true for me. If anything would shock me out of my past behavior patterns, it's this. The one thing I have in my mind that is stable and that gives me some source of pride is my job. I've come very close to losing it because of my actions, which I take full responsibility for. I'm the one to blame for all of this. What I've done is cut both ways. It's hurt the victim and it's hurt me. It's a no-win situation. All I can do is beg you, please spare my job. Please give me a chance to show that I can, that I can tread the straight and narrow and not get involved in any situation like this ever again. I would only ask, I beg you, please don't destroy my life. I know I deserve a great deal of punishment. I'm not trying to elicit your sympathy, but I would ask you, please, please don't wipe me out completely. And please listen to this. The court, do you have relationships with adult males? Defendant, Mr. Dahmer, I have had in the past, not recently. This enticing a child was the climax of my idiocy. It's just, it's going to destroy me. I'm afraid this one incident. I don't know what in the world I was thinking when I did it. I know I was under the influence. Catch this, catch this line. As far as purposely drugging him, that was never my intention. I've been taking sleeping pills because I worked third shift for several years now. I can take, I take quite a few of them because I built up a tolerance to them and it was never my intention to purposely drug him. I wouldn't have offered him money if I had planned on drugging him, but nevertheless, I'm not trying to excuse that. Ladies and gentlemen, he's fooled a lot of people, including the court that gave a year's probation, uh, five years probation, one year at the House of Correction. Please, please, don't let this murderous killer fool you with this defense that Dr. Berlin there's a special defense of Dr. Berlin. Decent man, but off the beaten path in terms of forensic psychiatry. I close with this quote from the confession. Officers asking, bath police officers are there. This officer asked what the reason for the murders was, and Jeffrey L. Dahmer replied, my own warped, selfish desire for self-gratification this officer asked a second time about the reason for the murders, and he again replied, my own warped, selfish desire for self-gratification. I must rest now. Mr. Boyle, as is proper because he carries the burden of proof, will make his final argument to you. He is an honorable man. He is very persuasive. He is effective, and he is competent, as he argued earlier. Do not confuse him with the defendant. The defendant is on trial, not Mr. Boyle. Keep that in mind. I won't have a chance to answer again. Please keep in mind all the evidence and weigh it carefully when you make this decision. Thank you very, very much. You would like a break, Mr. Boyle?
Uh, it'll be a short one then. Court, courts in recess. <laughs>